uh, there are two different types of shoulder replacement. Okay, there's an anatomic shoulder replacement and a reverse shoulder replacement. What an anatomic shoulder replacement is, is just like what it sounds, you're trying to reestablish their anatomy. So you have a ball and a socket, and there's a coating over the end of that, which is the cartilage surface. If the cartilage surface breaks down, that's what leads to arthritis, and that leads to pain, and it can lead to, to poor function. So what a replacement of the shoulder is, is just like an, a hip or a knee. You're removing the diseased bone and replacing it with metal and plastic materials that provide a smooth surface. So that way it reduces your pain and it improves your function. This is the anatomic shoulder replacement. The clear plastic is the bone. You remove the cap of bone where the ball is and replace it with a metal ball. And then you smooth out the surface where the socket is and you replace it with a plastic piece that fits onto the face of it. A reverse shoulder replacement is completely different. What it is is where you have the ball, the ball gets removed and replaced with a deep socket. And where the socket is, you attach a ball onto the surface of it. The ball then sits down into a socket. And you say, well, why would you do a reverse shoulder replacement? The reason you would do a reverse shoulder replacement is because it has a built-in constraint. The ball sits into a socket that helps to hold it in. So anything to where there's a potential to where there's an, a problem with instability where the ball is dislocating. If there's a big rotator cuff tear where the muscles that are supposed to help hold the ball into the socket are torn or not working and the ball is sliding around, any of those type of things are what the reverse shoulder replacement can help to restore so that you can then raise your arm and use it. So most of the time I break it down into two simple things. What bothers you most? Is it pain or function? Most people say both. So really what we try to do when we're treating somebody is manage their pain and, and try to improve their function. So what most of the time what, so, what brings somebody to see me is because they start having nighttime symptoms. It seems like a lot of people can compensate and figure out a way to adapt or, or modify their activities during the day to where they can get through and try to minimize their pain or use their other arm. But at nighttime, it's hard. And so when you're trying to sleep at night and it wakes you up, then that's what draws you and brings you to the doctor. So initially, the approach is, is we try to do things to manage your pain. You try that in a pill form. You do it over the counter. If that doesn't work, you do a prescription. If the prescription doesn't work, then you try a cortisone shot. Cortisone shots can be very effective. They can be long lasting. And if they work, you can repeat them every few months. If you fail those injections, then we look at other alternatives to manage your pain. And that's when you may consider surgery. The same thing I discuss is, is function, okay? So function, that could be simple things like eating and dressing and bathing, or it could be more extensive like a recreational sport or a hobby. Uh, and so you have to look at every patient individually and say, what function limitations do you have and, and how does that affect your quality of life? Can we affect it? Can we do exercise or stretches and make it better? And if not, and you're looking in the mirror and you say, listen, my pain is not being managed. My function is, is horrible and I can't do what I want to do, then you may consider doing something surgically. For a shoulder replacement, I try to break it down into, into three separate phases for uh, recovery or recuperation. Most of the time, this is a surgery that people can have and go home the next day. Younger patients and, and more motivated, you can actually go home the same day of the surgery. Uh, the three phases that I break it down is a six-week period of rest. It takes time for these to heal. Your bone heals into the implant. It's like a dental implant. Um, the muscles, the soft tissues have to heal around it. So for about six weeks, we take it easy and we rest. During that period of time, everything you do is with your arm down at the side. You can read through the paper, you can type on a keyboard, you can lean over and eat, but I don't want people raising or reaching their arm actively away from the side. After six weeks, we start doing stretching and you start using your arm. You're not lifting much. It's a, a pound or two, a cup of coffee, but you're starting to use it for simple activities like combing your hair, reaching up in, into the cabinet, uh, pushing the buttons on the microwave. And then we start a simple stretch. Most, most of my patients don't require any formal physical therapy. I spend time in all the visits and I instruct patients on stretching exercises so they can start to regain mobility of their arm. By three months, it's healed. At the three month mark, we start progress uh, progressively increasing uh, activity and the vigorousness and the length of time and how you do things. And then we teach additional things on how to build the strength up in the arm. Most people by six months, they feel pretty good. They can do most vigorous activities, but you have the ability to improve for a year and sometimes beyond that. 
So from an outcome standpoint, when we look at, at uh, shoulder replacements, they carry about a 95% satisfaction rating, depending on, on obviously what they're pre-existing uh, problem is. Um, the, the longevity, if you looked long term, uh, we look at it based on breakdowns of 10, 15, 20 years and beyond. And so historically, if you look at the long term data, it suggests that, uh, that upwards of 80% or more can last 20 years. Now the thing to understand is that's on 30 year old or more technology. So the technology we have today is a lot better. The plastic materials are a lot better and our techniques are better. So the theory is, is that they may last even longer than that because it's a non-weight bearing joint. If you look at a reverse shoulder replacement compared to a, an anatomic shoulder replacement, we don't have the long-term data on a reverse yet. We have about 10 to 12 years. There's some European data that's a little bit longer. But the early projections as far as what we see, uh, the, the survivorship actually looks a little better than what the historic anatomic shoulder replacements look like. I think the thing is, is people ask, what can I and what can't I do after a shoulder replacement or after a reverse shoulder replacement and I uh, I don't really want to put a, a limit as to what you can or can't do most people they're they're not doing a whole lot of vigorous things but uh, but some people do and some people want to exercise or they want to play golf or tennis or lift weights so what I tell people is this is that uh, after a reverse shoulder replacement the things that you want to avoid is anything where you're purposefully thrown to the ground you don't want to do anything where you're going to fall to the ground and break your arm or dislocate the implant so no tackle football no ice hockey no MMA fighting and those type of things. If you want to lift weights, it's an artificial bearing surface. You got to be smart about it. So you can lift weights, but you do it within reason and try to do more tone as opposed to bulk.